evening at Redeemer Church. Our very first Easter together. For a lot of you, this is the first time you've joined us here at the Municipal Auditorium, and we're excited that you are here with us uh, this morning. I do have just a few announcements, um, because what would be church without them? Kiddos, if you've come in this morning, um, and are sitting in service with us, not normally in service with us, but are this morning for Easter, welcome. I hope you picked up a kid's bag back there on that back table. And if you, um, if you didn't, then grab one for sure. In that bag, there's a coloring book and some crayons, and there's a sheet that will help uh, kind of guide you through the service today, through the sermon. And on that sheet are a few key things that Cole's going to say during his sermon that you can write down the answers to. And then after church, you bring that out in the lobby to me, and I will have a prize for you if you fill out the sheet during the sermon. Okay, so listen really carefully and listen for Cole to say those things. Um, then, as you leave today... Uh, all of your families will be getting an Easter gift bag from us at Redeemer Church. And in that bag are a few really awesome things. Uh, one, you'll be getting a booklet called the Case for Christ Answer Booklet, which is a fantastic resource. If you have questions um, as you're kind of navigating through this faith, or if you have friends who are asking you questions that you're not sure how to answer, that book will be for you. Uh, also in that bag is a card that invites you to join us uh, to a ministry called Right Now Media. It is an online streaming uh, access to thousands of Bible study resources. Consider it a Netflix of Bible studies. And Redeemer Church has purchased the membership, and then we want you to use it and to grow in your faith. And so on that card, there's a QR code you can scan and if you're not sure how to make that happen, there's also a link that you can just go to. And you can create an account uh, and then at your fingertips, thousands of Bible study resources for you. We would like you to invite you also to join us next Sunday. We'll be back at the 4th Street Theater uh, for our regular service time, 10 a.m., and Cole's going to be starting an exciting new series, a four-week series on Samson, uh, which will be incredible for all of us who um, are walking with Jesus, who are um, kind of trudging through this life, or if you know people who have maybe walked away from church, walked away from the faith, Samson uh, is just a guy who lives it out, and we can learn so much from his life. And so Cole's going to be starting that sermon series next week, and we want to invite you to be a part of that with us. When you leave here today, you'll also get this card uh, that kind of helps you take today's message, uh, take it home with you this week, so that the work the Lord has started in you today can continue beyond Sunday. And then some important upcoming events on the back of that card as well. The last thing, men, if you are going to Springfield next weekend for the men's conference, whew, Bill Wright needs to see you uh, just right over here at the front corner after service so you can talk about travel details. We are so excited that you are here with us this morning to celebrate our resurrected King. Would you stand as we worship together? All right, I was reading this morning. It said uh, the angel told the women, why are you looking for the living one among the dead? Uh, he is not here, he is risen. Let's celebrate the risen Savior this morning, amen.
First Peter that we have a living hope. We can't go to a grave somewhere and visit the body of Jesus. Amen. We have a living hope. And let's sing about that.
Corinthians 15, 54. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death couldn't hold you down We're gonna lift our voice in victory Gonna make your praises loud The enemy has been defeated And death couldn't hold you down Gonna lift our voice in victory Gonna make your praises loud Cause the enemy It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd Mary's crying Peter is denying 
but they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning and evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. You the church, Sunday is here. So, hey, I know this is going to sound really crazy, okay, but you just, you have to entertain me for a second, all right? Um, this is our first Easter Redeemer. <laughs> It's ridiculous. It's our first Easter. We thought there might be 10 or 12 of you guys who were sitting at the park having Easter. We didn't know. And so, I, I just just because of the generation that we live in, and I don't even know how to take a selfie, so I'm figuring this out. But um, do me a favor. Would you take, would you allow Lindsay to take your picture, Redeemer? And could I just take a selfie with you? Would that be okay? Oh, goodness. One, two. Hey, in the balcony, you're not smiling. One, two, three. Take it over here, take it over here. That's the good side, absolutely, we're gonna go up. Thank you so much. So, anyway, that's it. We are so excited you are here. Um, so I can remember the first time I heard the gospel account and about how Jesus died for my sins and how he was buried and how on the third day he rose victorious over sin and death, came back to life so that I could have new life as well. And I can remember I was a teenager in high school and, and um, we, didn't, we didn't do church in my family. I didn't really know the gospel story. And it wasn't until I was presented with the truth about Jesus that I heard really about the resurrection in its entirety. And I remember hearing this passage and it took me by surprise. I thought 
It was a really bold statement. And so this morning, I just want to let you know something that all over, not only the nation that we live in, but the world, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of people that are gathering together. Some of them only attend church, maybe once a year, twice a year at most. And one of the times they do that is on Easter because Easter changes everything. New life changes everything. And you might say, why? Why? Why does everyone gather for Easter? Why is Easter such a big deal? Well, here is what a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul said about what is so important about the resurrection, about the new life that Jesus came to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you've got that up there, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 12 through 14, here's what the Apostle Paul says about the resurrection. He says this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Listen to this. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Jesus Christ himself has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. He says this, when it comes to if Friday or Sunday is more beneficial, if there was no Sunday, then Friday doesn't matter. Because here's the deal. If Jesus simply died for your sins and he is not victorious over sin and death and he can't give you the same victory and the same new life, then we have no reason to celebrate and we are dead in our sin even as we sit here. But guess what, folks? Sunday is here. And so this morning, what I want to do just very quickly is we are going to go to a guy by the name of Peter's life. We're going to look at three things that took place in the life of Peter. And in doing so, I want to show you how the resurrection of Jesus changes everything and how it can change you too, maybe even for the first time. So we're going to be jumping around, but if you have your, book, your Bibles, go to the book of Luke chapter 5. It's going to be up on the screen as well. I'm going to give you a little context. Here's what's taking place right before we get to Luke chapter 5. Jesus is, is walking along and he's teaching the people. He's teaching multitudes of people and they're flocking to him. And he gets down by the sea and he, and he he needs a better vantage point to be able to see them and a better spot to speak to them from. And so he comes up and there's this guy named Peter and his boys and they're fishermen. Okay, they're full-time fishermen. And I know what you're saying. I would love to be a full-time fisherman, right? That would be a good gig. Well, that's not the type of fishing they're doing, okay? They are more of the cast the net over the side and drag the fish in type of fishermen. And what we know is that um, Jesus walks up to him and he says, hey, they've just gotten done fishing. They have fished all through the night. And he says, hey, do me a favor. I need to speak to these group of people. So what I want you to do is I want you to let me step on your boat. You're going to row me out 100 yards or so. And then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to speak to the people so they can all see me. And so Peter does just that. And in Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, here's what scripture says take place. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, and this is Simon Peter, and in this portion of scripture identifies him as Simon, but this is Peter. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. Meaning, Lord, we fished all through the night. We caught diddly squat. But at your words, I will let down the nets. Look at verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, so many that their nets were breaking. This is the first time that Peter and, and, and his friends have come face to face with Jesus. And guess what happens? Jesus uses the one thing that Peter would listen to to get his attention. Peter had done everything in his own power to provide for himself and his family and had failed miserably. Jesus shows up on the scene and says, hey, I want you to do the thing that you've done before that you even think that I'm crazy for suggesting because you've tried it and it hasn't worked. You ever been there? God ever told you to do something that you've done before and you say it hadn't worked and he said, yeah, that's just because you didn't have my power. Right? And so they cast those nets, they bring them up and here is Peter's response. Peter's response when he sees this is he literally falls on his knees and says, surely you are the Lord. 
And he says these words. I will follow you. I will follow you, Jesus. And at this moment, Peter, for the first time, thinks this Jesus might actually be the Messiah. He might actually be God in the flesh come to save his people. He thinks he may just be the Messiah. And what this does is it leads us to a point where Peter walks with Jesus for three years or so. Daily, he's with him. He's everywhere he's going. And it's not just Peter. It's a group of 12 guys that go with him. It's those 12 guys, family members. It's, it's, it's multitudes of people. And they walk with Jesus. And Jesus teaches them every single day. And make no mistake about it. Peter sees them do miracles. Peter sees Jesus raise dead people back to life. He sees him make blind people see. He makes him see, uh, makes, he sees Jesus have lame people walk. He sees Jesus do amazing things through these three years. Very similar to what Jesus had done in his life, where he has him cast out the nets and did what Peter and his humanness could not. So Peter saw all of these things. And that got him to the point because at that moment he thought that Jesus was the Messiah and nothing had changed where he came to a point where he made what I like to call the big statement. If you put up the bold statement, the statement that changes everything, you might call it a declaration. Peter, after three years of walking with Jesus, makes a statement that, wow, it just seems bold. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 30 through 35, here is what Peter says to Jesus. Look at this. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is Jesus talking to his disciples right before he's getting ready to be captured and hang on that cross and die for the sins of the world, including you and me. Then Jesus said to them, watch this, you will all fall away because of me this night. Everyone do me a favor. Everyone say all. all. You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Verse 32. But after I am raised up, praise the Lord, Jesus is going to be raised up, right? I will go before you to Galilee. And here's Peter doing exactly what Cole would have done. And Peter answered him by trying to stick his foot in his mouth, right? And he says this, Jesus, though they all, everybody say all, all. though they all fall away because of you, look what he says, I will never fall away. Look at verse 34. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter, with boldness and faith, says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. I will not deny you. And look at this. And all the disciples said the same. It's a bold move, Cotton. Let's we'll see how that plays out, right? It's a bold move. I will not deny you. I've got a question for you. It's got two parts. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on this one, okay? Even though it's Easter, all right? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, but I need you to listen to both parts of the question before you start to raise it up. First part of the question. Have you ever, has anyone in here ever told the Lord that you would never do something, sin, rebellion, bad mistake, hurtful thing. Have you ever told the Lord that you wouldn't do something again? Now wait for it. The second part of the question is, but then you went and did it again. Raise your hand if you've ever done that before. It's literally like a death star. It covers everybody, right? You got, got it all. Like everybody. It's us. Like you told the Lord, I won't do it again. God, I will never use that type of language again. And then someone makes you mad at what happens, you do it again. God, I will never talk to my children like that again. And then they ask you the same question for the 19th time. What do you do? You do it again, right? And, and, and God, I will never um, be involved in such and such a sin again. And no one's watching and no one's around. And you find yourself in the same sin again, right? This happens to 
us. We've all been there, right? We've made bold statements to the Lord. And we've done it again. The second thing I want us to see is not only the bold statement of Peter, but if you put that second one up, Angela, here, I want you to see there's a part where he has a big denial. Remember, how many people did Jesus say out of that group of disciples were going to deny him? How many did he say? All, right? So here we go. If you'll look in Matthew chapter 26, what, right where we were at, if you'll go to verses 69 through 74, here is the account of what takes place in Peter's life. Peter, who had seen Jesus catch a multitude of fish, Peter, who had seen Jesus bring dead people back to life, make blind people see, Peter, who said, I will not deny you. Here he goes. Verse 69 through 74, here's what it says. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You were also with Jesus the Galilean, weren't you? But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you mean. Now, I have to give you some context here. What has taken place right now, okay, is that between the time when Jesus told Peter and the disciples that they would deny him, now what has taken place is that Judas Iscariot has sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Okay? The, the soldiers have come and they have taken Jesus and they have brought him because Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. That was what he was charged with. The Jews believed that that was blasphemy, meaning that he was saying something about God that was not true. That makes it blasphemous. And that was punishable by death. And so what the Jews did to Jesus and what the Romans were a part of in doing to Jesus was the same thing, I just want to be honest with you, that you and I would have done to Jesus. Because... According to them, he was claiming to be something that he wasn't, and he was misleading the people. And so what happens here is Jesus has now been beaten and spit on, put on mock trial, okay? And they are in a courtyard, and these courtyards aren't huge. And Peter is there along with the other disciples, and they are watching Jesus go through the torture that he's going through. And this servant girl comes up and says, weren't Weren't, weren't you with Jesus of Galilee and don't, don't you know him? But he denied it before them all, before everyone. He says, I don't even know what you mean. I don't even know that, Jesus. Look at verse 71. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man right here, this Peter, he was with Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, no. And not only does he say no, he swears an oath. You see how big this is? He denies it with an oath and he says, I don't know that man. Look at verse 73. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and they said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them for your accent betrays you. You've been hanging out with those fishermen guys who are hanging out with Jesus and we can tell so because you good old boy redneck accents fooling people. Like it gave you away. You said y'all four times. We know who y'all, right? I believe that's probably, that's scriptural. I think it's there. <laughs> Look at Peter's response. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, all right? I do not know the man. That's three. And the scripture says that at that moment, immediately the rooster crows. Can you imagine how bad Peter felt? You ever been there? Anyone in here that claims to be a follower of Jesus ever made a mistake? Your sin's been found out. Either your words or your lifestyle didn't back up what you claim to believe. And at that moment, you come to the realization that I did it. Again, this is Peter. Not only that, but the beautiful thing about Scripture is that there are multiple accounts of what takes place in the disciples' lives and in the life of Jesus during this time. And in fact, 
we have a more intimate account by a guy by the name of Luke. Luke was a physician by trade. That meant as a doctor that when he explained things, he explained them in detail, okay? And in Luke chapter 22, verses 60 through 61, he is identifying the exact same account. Watch what he says. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crows. This is the third time. And watch what verse 61 says Jesus does at this moment. Watch this. And the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. It's a small courtyard. A Jewish courtyard, really a large one, would have been 30 yards by about 30 yards, okay? It wasn't huge. The reality is, is that Jesus is probably only standing yards away from Peter. Peter who said, I will not deny you. I will not do it. In fact, Jesus, I love you so much. I'll give up my life for you. If they take you to be killed, I'll be killed with you. I'll go down first. This is the same guy who earlier in the garden, when they came to capture Jesus, you remember what Peter did? He took out a sword and cut a dude's ear clean off. He's denied Jesus three times, and upon the third time when he does, Jesus looks him right in the eye. Here's what I want you to remember. What has Jesus already gone through up until this moment? He's been beaten. He's had a crown of thorns pressed into his head. He's been spit on. Peter looks at his Savior, and his Savior looks at him in the eye. Black eyes, blood trickling down his brow, spit covering his face. And he looks at him as if to say, I see you. I see you. You ever been there? And some of you might be saying, Cole, here's the deal, man. I Man, it's Easter. This is heavy. What? Listen, I've never, I've never denied Jesus with my words. Like, I've never gone out and said, Jesus, I, I don't believe in you. I don't trust you. I've never done that. And, and you know what I'm saying? That's awesome. I love everything about that. But let me just ask you a question. You may not have denied him with your words, but have you denied him with your works? Have you denied Jesus with your works? Here is what Titus 1.16 says. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. We've all been there, right? You've been there, I've been there. We who claim to know Jesus, just like Peter, who have seen Jesus do amazing things many times, we find ourselves in the same situation as Peter has. And so you're, you're saying, what, what is the reason? What's the reason for the resurrection? What is the reason? Ladies, come on up. What is the reason for the resurrection? What, what is the big difference maker that there is? The difference maker is this. This is before Jesus has been resurrected. Peter thought that Jesus was the Messiah. And guess what? Thinking that Jesus is the Messiah, thinking that he's the Son of God, it's just not enough. Because when you just think that Jesus is the Messiah, when things get tough, when life gets hard, causes you to choose the easy way rather than the God-honoring way. And I just want to let you know something. This morning, Jesus is a Savior who really did live a perfect life and die a death to pay the penalty for your sins and mine. And he is a savior who is still in the business of taking broken people and giving them brand new life. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, this right here is my friend Krista. And Krista is from a ministry called Primrose Hill. And gals that are at Primrose Hill, um, they've had some things take place in life where, where maybe they've made some poor choices. Maybe they've been dishonoring to their Lord. Maybe they've had some broken relationships. But through the ministry of Primrose Hill, by pointing these ladies back to Jesus and their families, they have seen God do amazing things and breathe new life into women. And so this morning, I thought, you know what? You know what would be better than hearing me talk? Hearing Krista talk about new life. So she wants to do that for a few minutes. Hi. Um, I'm 
like extremely nervous. I've never talked in front of this many people. Um, so please bear with me. Um, but I'm Krista, I'm 25. Um, I am at Primrose. Um, I'm actually going to graduate in two days. Uh, but before I knew God, um, I was hopeless. I was a liar. Um, I was a thief. I um, was involved with a gang. I, I was a property of the gang. Um, I was not a mom. I actually have a, f a five-year-old now. But um, I was no longer a mom. I was irresponsible. I chased an addiction. Um, I was hopeless. I lost my son in the state of Kansas. Um, and that was kind of my life. Um, and then I came to Primrose. And since I've been at Primrose, oh, I was also um, going to prison for five years. Um, I had finally got caught. Um, I was a drug dealer also. So um, I came to Primrose, and since I was at Primrose, I am a mom now. Um, I have my son home with me full time. Instead of being in prison for five years, my residence was at Primrose Hill. Um, I love God now. I have a great new life. I'm no longer hopeless. Um, God can do amazing things. Um, I have a hope for life. I have a job waiting for me. Um, I destroyed every person in my whole entire life. I destroyed them because of my addiction. And to this day, my parents talk to me. My brothers talk to me. My family. Um, I have friends. I actually have now new sisters in Christ. Um, and I just search for God now. I don't search for an addiction. I don't search for a high. Um, and so with all that being said... Um, that's who I was, and with God, this is who I am today. So thank you guys so much. folks are clapping, listen, they are, they are clapping for you, and they are clapping for the decisions you've made, but more importantly, they're clapping because they believe that Jesus Christ is still in the business of performing miracles, and because he was resurrected and came to new life, that he can give you new life as well, and you start talking about followers of Jesus getting fired up about something, let them see evidence in new life, and that they actually, yeah, and so... Here's what I want you folks to be okay. Um, Krista actually leaves tomorrow, okay? She leaves tomorrow to go back. Oh, sorry, you're going Wednesday, okay, sorry. She's leaving Wednesday. See, I'm trying to kick her out too early. She leaves Wednesday, and she's going back home. And guess what? Hey, you know what? Although there's times in life where you need to be almost in a bubble, where you need to be in a community where people surround you and support you and love on you, you also have a world that God has called you to live in to have an impact for the kingdom for, right? And guess what? I believe that God is going to use her story to transform the community that she lives in, to transform her family, to transform her friends. And so I think there'd be no better thing than for the body of Christ to do on Easter than to pray for her and thank Jesus for the brand new life that he gives. Do we do that? Awesome. Do you want to come up? Let's just pray real quick, buddy. Father, we thank you that you are still in the business of transforming people, of making blind people see and making dead people rise. Father, we thank you that you're in the business of taking the broken, hot mess of our life and turning it into something that brings you glory. Father, that's what Easter's about, because if Jesus has not been resurrected from the dead, then we are dead in our sin even now. But praise the Lord that you have risen and you can bring us to new life as well. And so, Father, we thank you for the new life that is abundantly evident in Krista's life. We thank you for the things that are taking place that are not explainable by the hands of men, but are only explainable by a mighty movement of your spirit. And God, we join together in this church and say, we believe you can do it again. 
And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you. And we pray now as Krista gets ready to leave and go back. Father, that you would remind her of all that you've delivered her from. And that you would remind her that even when she falls short, even when she denies you in word and deed, that you are not done with her yet. Father, thank you for your grace, love, and mercy. We lift Krista up to you now. Would you use her and maybe just maybe make her one of the mightiest women of God of her entire generation? Father, we love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I'm telling you folks, Sunday is here. It's here. So, it's hard if you know me not to get excited, all right? So, we're just getting to the good stuff. Now, here's the deal. So you say, Cole, you talked about Peter, and you talked about his life, and you talked about this, this bold statement that he made, this, this declaration, and, and, and you talked about this, this big denial that he made, and, and the fact that we can all kind of relate to that, right? But what you haven't shown me is how broken Peter becomes Peter that God continues to use. Well, I would love to tell you about that, Angel. If you put this third point up here, I want to talk to you about the real commitment that takes place in Peter's life that changes everything. And it all goes back to the verse that we read in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection and how it changes everything and about how if Jesus has been brought back to new life, he can bring you back to new life as well. Because this is what happens to Peter. Now, here's the kicker. You ready? Here's what's happened between where we were and the scripture that we're going to. Jesus has voluntarily given up his life on that cross for your sins and for mine. His body has been broken. His blood has been shed. And he has said, it is finished. Upon doing that, they have to have a place to bury him. His disciples are heartbroken. They're running. They don't know what to do. Even though Jesus claimed that he was going to arise on the third day, they didn't totally understand what he was saying. And they're scared. And so a rich man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea actually buys or has a tomb uh, cave um, that he donates for Jesus to be, to be buried in. And here's the kicker you have to remember is that this guy, Jesus, because he's literally the son of God, as he walked and taught for those three years, he caused just a little bit of a stir. And there were people all over that knew that he claimed that he was going to give up his life and that he was going to come back to life. They knew what he said. So much so that even the Romans knew what he said. And the, and the Jews knew what he said. And they wanted this revolution to die. They didn't want this Jesus hype to go any further. And so what the scripture tells us is that Jesus is placed in a tomb and a huge stone is rolled in front of it. A stone so big that no men or two men can move it. There's an enormous thousands of pounds rock. And what do they do? They place a guard in front of the stone to protect anyone getting in or watch this, any Jesus getting out. Oh, Sandy, over the years when you preach, you ever get more excited than talking about Jesus coming back to life? Oh, here we go. So, here's what happens. They put this guard up there, and you know he's like, I got this. Not getting out. And he knows Jesus is dead. Remember what he did to Jesus. Not only did he give up his life, say he is finished, take his final breath, but just to make sure what they did, they took a spear and they ran that spear into Jesus' side. And scripture tells us that when that happened, that not only blood, but water flowed out. It shows the separation. That shows physical death. Okay? And so that takes place. And here's what happens. Three days later. One of the gals comes to check on Jesus, check on the tomb, and guess what she finds when she shows up? <laughs> Stone rolled away, guard not doing anything, 
Jesus' garments still in the tomb. Jesus is gone. So what happens? Jesus appears. Jesus appears to some ladies, appears to a few disciples, in fact goes on and appears to dozens of people. They see him, the resurrected Jesus, during those three days, conquers sin, death, and hell, comes back to life, okay, and then makes his resurrection known to other people. People are freaking out. They're going, oh my gosh, Jesus is back. People don't believe him. And then they touch, as you saw in the video, they touch the holes in his hands. They see the piercing in his side, and they go, this is really Jesus. And Peter heard the account as well. But sometimes, even when you know God's doing amazing things in the lives of other people, all you can see is your failure for the Lord in your life, isn't it? You ever been there? Watch this. So in John chapter 21, Jesus shows up on the scene and changes everything for Peter. Let me give you a little context in John chapter 21. You remember back in Luke chapter 5? What, what were Peter and his friends doing as a job? What were they doing? Just say it out loud. Fishing, right? Let me ask you something. They fished all night. How many fish did they catch? Zero. None. Guess what? Take a look at John chapter 21. You ready? John chapter 21, verse 3. Simon Peter is hanging out with his guys. Now watch this. I don't want you to miss this because you might be here this morning and this might be what you needed to hear. Peter, at this point, feels like an utter failure. He has failed Jesus. So what's he do when he fails Jesus and says, I can't do this. I, I, I just can't make it. I can't live up to what I think I can. Jesus, I, I can't really be a follower of yours. You know what he does? He goes back to his old life. You ever been there? You ever said, I'm going to trust, I'm going to follow Jesus, and when it doesn't work out, you just run back to your old life? Some of you guys right now, this is the only time of year you ever come to church, or maybe this is the first time in a long time you've come to church. Look, can I tell you something? Oh my gosh, we're so glad you're here. We are so glad you are here. Not so that you can hear some guy preach, and not so that you can watch some people play music, but so that Jesus can transform your life. Listen to me. Peter, he just went back to his old life. So what's he doing? He's hanging out with his boys, and he says, I'm going fishing. That's all he knows, right? He goes back to what he knows. Krista, that's not going to be your story. You're not going back to what you know. You're going to cling to Jesus. And he goes back to what he knows. And they say to him, we'll go with you. I don't know. Peter could have been suicidal, to be honest with you. Can you imagine how broken he is at this point? And they're like, we don't want to leave you alone. We'll go with you. So they do. And they went out and they got into the boat. But that night, what did they catch? Everyone say that loud. Nothing. And we've heard this story before. <laughs> Look at verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. This is the resurrected Jesus. This is post-resurrection. Days and days later. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Why didn't they know it was Jesus? Because guess what you don't expect to see when you're fishing? Dead guys come back to life. Right? Just, and if you tell me that you did... We'll say what you've been drinking, right? Now watch. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. Look at verse 6. And he said to them, <laughs> they've never heard this before, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. And you're sitting there going, what in the world is happening? Did the biblical writers get confused? No. You want to know what Jesus does to get Peter's attention to make sure that he understands that Jesus is still in the business of giving new life? He goes right back to where it started and he says, hey, remember the first time I jacked up your life by showing you my power and my glory? I'm going to do it again. Hey, Peter, take notice. Look what's going to happen. And so he does it. And scripture tells us that when this happens... That they all of a sudden go, boom, it says that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that he's like, oh my gosh, it's Jesus. He figures it out. Peter also figures it out. But Peter's response is a little different because Peter is filled with guilt and shame. And so Peter doesn't know what to do. And here's what happens. 
So many times people have asked me, Cole, why do you think Jesus did the same miracle twice? I think he's trying to show Peter that it's okay. I think he's trying to show Peter, remember that I worked in your life the first time, and after you failed me, can I show you something? I'm still going to work in your life in the same way, because guess what? I am a savior of second chances. A savior of second chances. And so, here's what takes place. Jesus then asked Peter some questions that you guys have heard about. We're not going to jump into those, but here's the deal. Jesus asked Peter three times. How many times did, did, did Peter deny Jesus? Three. three. And Jesus now is going to ask Peter three times the question, do you love me? And each time he does, Jesus or uh, Peter answers him with a, yes, I love you. And then Jesus tells him to do something. He tells him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Three times, okay? And by the third time... Peter is so hurt by the question and so overwhelmed at his shame that he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And she says, okay, then do something about it. Feed my sheep. Listen, what Jesus is saying to Peter, it's not a God named filet love. That, that's awesome if you want to go down that trail, but you want to know what the so what of the passage is? Jesus is saying this to Peter. I know you love me. I want you to understand that you love me. Even in the midst of your failure, I want you to understand that this does not disqualify you from serving me. Because guess what? I hold you up. You don't hold me up. And so here's what happens. In John chapter 21, verse 18 and 19, look at this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19. And the, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Church tradition tells us that Peter ultimately has his life taken from him because he is found guilty, guilty of perpetuating the lie that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he is found guilty of blasphemy, and they go to crucify him too. And in doing so, when Jesus says, you're going to have to stretch out your hands, that's what he means. But church tradition tells us that Peter has such high regard for his Savior at that moment, post-resurrection, that he says, you can't crucify me in the same way you did Jesus. You need to do it upside down. Because I won't die the way that my Savior did. I'm not worthy. But watch all of that. All of that. Peter has denied Jesus three times. The rooster has crowed. He's seen miracles again. And he's still broken. Jesus says to Peter, listen, here's how your story goes. Ultimately, you are going to follow me to the cross just like I told you in the beginning. But guess what? I still want you to do what? He says two words. And what are those words? Follow me. Follow me. This wasn't something that he hadn't heard before. In Matthew 16, 24, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he says this to Peter, or he says this to the disciples. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So here's the question. What's the difference? What's the difference in pre-resurrection Peter and post-resurrection Peter? I can't tell you how many times I've studied, reflected on this, preached about this passage, and I never caught this before. You ready? Jesus starts following, or Peter starts following Jesus in Luke chapter 5. In John 21, Jesus changes everything. What was the difference? Remember back in Matthew 26 when we were reading? Here's what Matthew 26 says in verse 58 as they're going through the courtyard. And Peter was following him, everyone say it together, at a distance. Can I ask you a question this morning? This morning as you sit here and you come to celebrate the resurrection of the Savior, maybe you're here because you're so excited about Jesus and maybe you're here because... Your wife or your husband or your family drug you here. Maybe we baited you with free breakfast. I hope not. We need breakfast anywhere, right? I don't know why you're here this morning, but can I ask you all a question? 
Are you following Jesus? And number two, let me ask you a question. Everyone look at me. Are you following him at a distance? Are you kind of following, but you're really, you're just kind of following him at a safe distance? You see, in Luke chapter 5, when Peter's fishing, and in the months and years to come, pre-resurrection of Jesus, Peter thought that Jesus was the Messiah. But always in the back of his mind, he had a backup plan, and he followed him at a distance. After Peter comes face to face with the resurrected Jesus, he realizes a couple things to be true, and he quits following him at a distance, and he really starts following him. In Acts chapter 2, okay, this same Jesus, or the same Peter, the same Peter who denied Jesus three times, after, after this reinstatement by Jesus, after he tells him he loves him, watch what happens. In Acts chapter 2, Peter... God uses Peter to start the church. Peter goes out and on the day of Pentecost, he preaches the gospel and 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus. And it's this amazing thing. And that's Peter. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, God uses Peter to transform the people around him. And in Acts chapter 4, Peter and, and uh Peter and, and John go before the Jewish council and they actually give a, a testament or a testimony to the amazingness of Jesus and how he transforms life. And he was in more danger in that council than he was ever in in the courtyard when he denied Jesus. And here he is and he's standing boldly and he's saying, and Jesus can give you new life as well. What's the difference? The resurrection is the difference. Because here's what Peter understood. Watch this. When Jesus called him in Matthew 16 to deny himself, take up his cross and follow him, watch this. He knew he was following Jesus to death. And that's all that he knew. But post the resurrection, when he says to him, follow me, guess where Peter knows he's following Jesus? To new life. He's following him to new life, church. Hold on a second. If you're not excited about that, just do me a favor. Just check to see. Is it, is it still there? Is it still? He's following him to new life. To new life. Listen to me. And that's the same new life that we come to celebrate this morning. And here's the kicker. He says, I'll follow you, Jesus, because I know the cross isn't the end. It's just the beginning. And here's the deal. We've all done it, right? For most of us in this room, there has come a point in time where we have pledged to place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now, some of you, you've never made that decision. I'm going to give you the opportunity to think about that and possibly even do that in just a moment. But for most of us in this room, you've done that. Have you denied Him with your words? Have you denied Him with your works? If you're being really honest this morning, are you following him at a distance? Not walking with Jesus like you should be. Can I just give you some really good news this morning? Because that's what the gospel is. It's good news, right? The gospel isn't about guilt and shame and condemnation. The gospel is about good news and new life. You ready? You ready for this? Even if you're following Jesus at a distance today can be the day where you quit playing games and lay it all down and you choose to follow him with everything that you are and you accept the new life that only Jesus Christ can give. And I believe that that's what some of you guys need to do today. I made a commitment when I was 15 years old to follow Jesus, and I made that commitment to the best of my ability. But I just want to let you know something. At the age of 15, when I made that commitment, for those first five years, I was following Jesus at a distance because here's what I wanted Jesus to be. I wanted him to be my get-out-of-hell-free card, not my new life. Right? I wanted him to take away my sins, not jack my life up. Okay? And at age 20, at age 20, I didn't just think that Jesus was the Messiah. I knew that he was, and I knew that he gave me life, and I knew that he gave new life to me, and I knew that I had to quit playing games and quit playing church because he was the only one that could give new life 
to my friends and my neighbors and my family and my community, and that if I didn't share the truth of the gospel with them, that no one else could. Um, someone told me this morning, I call I love coming to Redeemer because you're so excited when you're jacked up about Jesus. I'm jacked up about Jesus too. Guess what? I have no idea how we're doing church all around America and people aren't passionate about Jesus. If you're boring people with the gospel, again, just, just check it. Just... I don't know. Like, I just don't know. And I'm just telling some of you guys are offended by it. Get over it, right? Don't get excited about Jesus and change your life. And that's how you it. So here it is. You ready? I made that decision at 15 to follow Jesus. And I followed at a distance. And at 20, I said, Jesus, take all of me. That was post-resurrection Jesus in my life. You know what I'm saying? I saw the truth and I owned it. And I said, Jesus, you can have my life because I know you're giving me new life. And I think today, maybe that some of you in this room need to make that decision. I think some of you need to make that decision. I know this is hard for you to believe in closing, but there's actually been a few times in life where I've actually made poor decisions and denied Jesus. Two. Two times. <laughs> Too many times to count. <laughs> Jesus says to Cole, do you love me? Do you know all things? you know that I love you? And he says, follow me. And he says to you, do you love me? And you say, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. You know what he's saying to you this morning? Follow me. Follow me. So this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to have a moment of prayer with you. And then we're going to close by singing and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus together. So what I'm going to ask is, would you all bow in prayer with me this morning? Could you have every hand out and I close? I simply want to ask you a few questions and pray with you, okay? Now, this morning, um, we have celebrated a risen Savior. And that risen Savior is still in the business of performing miracles. And I believe this morning that he might want to perform a few more miracles. I'm just crazy enough to think that Jesus is still in the business of saving souls and transforming lives. And so here's my question for you this morning. If you're here this morning and you would say, I, I believe that I have truly made the decision to follow Jesus. But if I'm absolutely honest with myself, Today, I'm following Jesus at a distance, and I want to have the same transformation taking place in my life that took place in Peter's life. I want to be all in. I want to follow Jesus. I want to know that his resurrection and new life can bring me new life as well. And I know that I need to recommit myself to the Lord today on Easter. Nail it down and say, man, Jesus, I belong to you. Use me to transform my world. If that's you this morning, with no one looking around just simply to give glory to God, would you just raise your hand up high? Raise it up high. What would you be ashamed of? Oh, but God's here in your life. No one's looking at you. It's, it's, it's only me, and I don't even take a picture. So look at this. Lord, I pray for individuals that are raising their hands all over, Lord, that you would use them to transform their world. And here's what I believe, that for some of you, um, there's some things that have taken place in your life that have left you broken and bitter and hurting, and you just kind of want to go back to your old life, and maybe you even have. But today is a day of salvation and new life for you. And so here's what I'm going to encourage you to do before you leave here. Um, we have some folks in the back, some counselors. You'll see them. They're going to be standing in the back not doing anything else. And here in just a moment, we stand and sing. I would encourage you just simply so that you can find help and peace and accountability would you just slip back there and talk to one of these counselors and tell them about the fact that you today are making the decision to not follow jesus at a distance would you do that and maybe you're here this morning and you would say this cole i um i'm not following jesus at a distance i've never placed my faith and trust in jesus he has never taken away my sin he's never given me new life but today I realize that that is what I need to do. Just as Peter placed his faith and trust in Jesus and God used him to transform his world, I also want to place my faith and trust in Jesus. I want Jesus to take away my sins. I want him to make me a brand new person. And I want to follow Jesus. And today on Easter, I want to make that decision for the first time. Time. If that's you this morning with no one looking around, simply to give glory to God, if that's you, just raise your hand up high. Raise it up high if that's you and you want to make that decision for the first time. Absolutely. I see you up there. Anybody else? 
Here's what I want you to do. If that's you, we also have some counselors in the back that would love to talk to you. Here in just a moment when we sing, would you just go to them and say, hey, um, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want him to transform me and make me brand new. I need to be saved. And they would love to talk with you about some next steps to doing that. So church, guess what? Now we want to cry out to God in prayer and sing songs of praise to a risen Savior. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the new life that you give us in Christ. And we pray that because of the resurrection, that everything in our life would be changed, that we would leave here in the newness that only Jesus provides. Thank you for showing up and transforming our life. We love you, Jesus, and in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
Easter, everybody, let's sing our way out. 